Zov 56. A month and a half has already passed since I returned from the war in Ukraine. Yes, yes, I know you can't say this word war, it was banned, but still I have to say exactly war. Understand correctly. I'm already 33 years old and all my life I have been telling only the truth, even to my own detriment. Such a wrong word and I can't do anything about it. So this is a war. Our Russian army is uh, shooting the Ukrainian one, and she is shooting back. Shells and rockets are exploding there. Have you ever heard the sound of a shell approaching you? If not, then it's a pity. It's an unforgettable feeling from the vibration and whistle of the air when all the insides turn over. It's just breathtaking. Then, if you're lucky, you hear an explosion and think that this is definitely your day. Of course, if you understand that, uh, that nothing has been torn off by the blast wave and your body is uh, not, uh, has not taken some kind of fragment, but if not, then the day didn't set and this time you were unlucky. In short, the job still remains. At the same time, the military on both sides are dying, as well as civilians who were unlucky enough to live where they decided to start a war calling her a special, special military operation. Oh yes, we must also not forget about the accompanying war hunger, illness, sleepless nights, unsanitary conditions, and life with constantly off-the-scale adrenaline that consumes the resources of your body, giving strength, speed, and reaction. But then when you return from the war zone, you feel like a survivor a survivor lemon, and you realize that your health is not at all the same. Then there is also the morally painful pressure of your conscience on your heart and soul, if they are, of course, uh, because if you do not freely ask yourself the question of why you are doing this and for the good of what, why are you risking your life and leaving your health? Why are you polluting your already not so cloudless karma? Uh, now I will tell you uh, how I had to see this war and how I got into it in general. I am aware of the responsibility for spreading the word about my service. Uh, as a note, uh, the penalty for spreading military fakes in Russia uh, or discrediting the army is a crime uh, punishable by lengthy prison sentences. Uh, but to hide this from me means to continue to increase the losses. I was evacuated from the front line near Nikolaevsk uh, because uh, keratojunctivitis of the eye began. After another shelling of us, the earth flew into the trench and got into my eyes. It's not pleasant, but I consider it bullshit. I was lucky. My eyes began to inflame and one of them began to close after a few days. And the paramedics said that I needed to be evacuated. Without treatment, you can be left without an eye. I was taken to the med detachment, detachment in Kherson, occupied by us, from where I was evacuated to Sevastopol. Uh, the feeling that you experience when you leave the war zone is indescribable. Two months of dirt, hunger, cold, sweat, and the feeling of the presence of death nearby. It's a pity that they don't let reporters to our front line, which is why the whole country cannot admire the paratroopers overgrown, unwashed, dirty, thin, and embittered. It's not clear what else. Stubborn Ukrainians who do not want to be denazified, or their mediocre command, unable to equip them even during the hostilities. Half of my guys uh, changed clothes and went in Ukrainian uniforms because it was of better quality and more comfortable or their own was worn out, and our great country is not able to dress, equip, and feed its own army. For example, from the be very beginning, I didn't have a Ratnik kit. Uh, the Ratnik, uh, that translates to warrior, that's the uh, new digitized uh, military uniform and uh, the accompanying accoutrement. Uh, and cross the border without even having a sleeping bag. A week later, the guys brought me an old one, not the commander's plea note, please note, uh, but it had a broken zipper 
to say that I was glad uh, to say nothing to him. Sleeping on the ground in a torn zipper bag, a sleeping bag in winter on the front line and in Ukraine and in March, uh, there were frosts. This is another trip. In short, somewhere in the middle of March, my legs and back began to hurt. I thought for a long time that it was muscles or ligaments or stupidly endured limping and attributing everything to the fact that we hardly took off our armor and helmets. But later I learned that from sleep on frozen ground, lack of water and food combined with loads, I earned osteochondrosis of all sections of the spine, uh, protrusions, a hernia in the neck, a sequestered hernia in the lower back, and incomprehensible pain in leg joints. So about the evacuation, and then, bam, you're taken out from there and you feel joy at the same time that you were leaving this asshole of a region and feeling annoyance that your comrades remain there and it is not known what will happen to them next. A feeling of happiness for himself is mixed with a sense of guilt towards colleagues, which are there, and you leave them. We drove in a Pazik. Uh, Pazik is uh, the affectionate name for a bus made by a Pavlovsky uh, Autobus Zavod. Uh, the driver and in the cabin, there were 20 wounded, dirty, exhausted people. Uniforms uh, soaked in blood on the faces of those who were seriously wounded, pain and longing were red. Those who are easily, <clears throat> who are easily the joy of that, that they were uh, finally leaving there because I was not injured, evacuation was carried out as a patient. So I sat on a step in front of the exit door. There were not enough seats for everyone. And uh, there were many who were less fortunate than me. It was necessary to go five hours or six, I don't remember exactly. It was at this moment that I finally relaxed and thought about the last two months of my life, about what it was, why I needed it, did I do something good or vice versa bad? Uh, why did I participate in it and how I was there at all? At that moment, and still inside of me, uh, and still inside of me is not the internal dialogue from a cocktail of conscience, patriotism, and common sense stops. If we look at templates, then the answer will be that I am a military man, a paratrooper. I am obliged to fulfill orders and do not have the right to be cowardly and not go to war when she is started. I am obliged to serve for the good of my country and protect the people of Russia. But then common sense begins to contradict and ask questions like, how did Ukraine threaten Russia? Everyone around is talking about the fact that Ukraine wanted to join NATO. But do we attack all countries that want to join NATO? Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland are already in NATO. Finland is joining NATO now. Turkey shot down one of our planes not so long ago, but, but it, it was quickly forgotten. Japan is claiming some of our islands. Damn it, the United States borders us on the east, but for some reason all this is not a reason to start a war. We're not attacking them, or is it just for now? It turns out that this is not the reason. Uh, another question, if we had not attacked Ukraine, would it, would it have attacked us? Many echo the TV that we launched a preemptive strike, but how can you believe that Ukraine would have attacked Russia, Crimea, if the armed forces of Ukraine could not even hold their own borders? Uh, they are waging a defensive war and suffering huge losses. Anyone knows that the, the war in defense is easier than attacking. How could this country, which defends itself with difficulty, slowly, but losing its territories, attack? And wouldn't it be easier for our army to strengthen the borders and defenses around Ukraine and, in the event of their attack, meet the enemy on the defensive, break their offensive potential, and go on the counterattack? After all, in this case, our losses would be much less, and the world community would not be able to accuse Russia of being an aggressor and glorify our country as an occupier and invader. It turns out that Ukraine was going to attack Russia is not true. And the next question. Ukraine was, in, was enslaved by Nazism and they infringe on the Russian population. 
But strange as it may seem, when communicating with people who were in Ukraine before the war, no one could remember a specific case that someone somehow infringed or offended him for having a Russian surname or not being able to speak Ukrainian. And some isolated cases of domestic conflicts on ethnic grounds can be found in any country in the world. We attacked to save uh, the Donetsk, <clears throat> the DNR and LNR, that is uh, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic. What are these uh, DNR and LNR? Indeed, in fact, and legally, these are two regions that were part of Ukraine, which rebelled and decided to become independent. Wouldn't it be the same if Karelia wanted to go to Finland, Smolensk region to Lithuania, Rostov to Ukraine, Yakutia to the US, or Khrabovsk to China? Isn't it the same? Why are we defending the LDNR? Did, or did ordinary people in the Donbass feel better? After all, in the Russian Federation, uh, we would not have tolerated this, just as uh, we did not once give independence to Chechnya, paying for it with, alive, with thousands of lives. Why did we do the same with our neighbors? But at the same time, the top of the uh, LPR and DPR, uh, despite the support of the government of the Russian Federation, could not provide their people with social security and give them uh, safety which is why people fled in mass to Russia, Crimea, and Ukraine. Communicating with people who fled the war in Donetsk and Luhan Lugansk, uh, I did not hear cases of Nazism that are shouted about from our media. But all as one talk about the fact that they fled from the war and that they just want to live and work in peace. If we tried in every possible way to help the people of Donetsk and Lugansk, then why didn't we limit ourselves to providing Russian passports to everyone? We have a lot of empty land that a human hand has not touched. Please, let them come, live and work with us. Why do we need territory, in fact, from a foreign state? What for? Are we short on land? Really? All those who wanted to live in Russia have not yet received Russian passports and moved to us? First, they decided to motivate us with money, and on February the 23rd, our divisional commander announced that we would receive $69 per day, which at that rate was about 7,000 rubli. Although here we were thrown, and in the end, we received 3,500 rubli per day. From the very first day when we realized that this was not the polite people operation in Crimea, and not just exercises, but a full-fledged war, had begun and crossing the border of Ukraine under the salvos of multiple launch uh, 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 missile systems, accompanied by combat helicopters and aircraft. Even then they began to say that such a job was not worth any money. But we are the defenders of the fatherland, the paratroopers, the pride of the fatherland and money is not the main thing. And if you have to get the, war, the order forward to the war, then something serious must have happened. Maybe the armed forces of Ukraine are already capturing Rostov, or perhaps the Americans have landed in Kamchatka. Without joking, I'm serious. At first, I assumed that something like this had happened, since we went to break through the border of Ukraine and received the order to capture Kherson. I did not see another logical explanation. Uh, oh, sorry, I uh, haven't introduced myself. Uh, guards, Mladzi Sergeant Filatiev, that's uh, Junior Sergeant Filatiev, uh, Sixth uh, Desha Air, uh, Second Desha B, uh, Fifty Six Desha P. Uh, that is uh, the Sixth Company, Second Battalion, Fifty Sixth Brigade of the Seventh Airborne Division, uh, Seven VDD. Yes, yes, exactly the Fifty Sixth Desha B which our mini, uh, Minister of Defense, S.K. Shaigu, decided to disband right on the eve of this war, probably in order to equalize the chances of Ukraine against Russia. Last year, the brigade was disbanded, equipped, well-organized, and equipped a brigade of 3,000 paratroopers, consisting of three assault battalions, a parachute battalion, a reconnaissance battalion, a tank battalion, 
which had its own artillery and air defense, is disbanded. In the brigade, there were almost no vacancies. A brigade that had been created 20 years ago in the city of Kamushin. They disband the destinies of the families and scatter them all over Russia. They create a regiment from the brigade. Well, like a regiment. From the regiment one name, leaving only one parachute battalion on a regular basis and transfer it to Crimea in the city of Feodosia, uh, combining it with the separate 171st Air uh, Assault Battalion already located there. And from these two battalions they form a regiment, a regiment consisting of an airborne battalion, an air assault, and a reconnaissance company, whose number is actually equal to a platoon. Not only is this not a regiment, so also the Airborne Assault Battalion was not fully staffed in terms of numbers. Moreover, our great reformers decided to create, as we were told, the Knight Experimental Airborne Assault Battalion by putting the entire battalion in ordinary WAS vehicles, not even armored. Uh, WAS is a 4x4 made by uh, Lyanovsk Avtosavot. Uh, it's sort of a jeep like um so that's exactly how the second uh de Chabé was sent to war i also forgot to mention that the battalion consists of three companies my company went to war with about 45 people and the other two 60 people each and that air assault battalion uh consisted of 165 attack aircraft brilliant well in principle but everything looks better in reports, uh, because the battalion is about 500 people. The number of uh, troops around Ukraine was, prob was about 200,000 in the same way. In my opinion, given the corruption and the system of photo reports that are now so bred in the army, when the command hides problems, about 100,000 Russian servicemen crossed the border of Ukraine on the first day. And this is against 200,000 military personnel of the armed forces of Ukraine. Uh, thanks to endless, ridiculous experiments and a lack of common sense, the army has finally ceased to be an attractive and, and promising place for the best youth. A situation when there was a shortage in military universe, uh, universities and contract service, which has been going on since 2003. Contract service is uh, professional enlisted men uh, volunteer enlisted men. Uh, the Russian military has been trying to move from a conscript base to a uh, enlisted based uh, army since about 2003. Has finally become a, a place where people from the lower social circles, to which unfortunately I also belong, because the uh, because the less educated and law savvy you are, the easy it is to manipulate you. In addition to all this, the Institute of Military Service was destroyed, turning it into a mixture of a kindergarten and a penal colony. When the soldiers of military service, having uh, rewound their term, go to civilian life without having learned anything, then telling their friends about it and anyone who had the opportunity prefers to simply avoid such a waste of their own life. Uh... But once upon a time, it was the conscript soldiers who successfully fought in Afghanistan and Chechnya. Successful, <coughs> excuse me. Successfully in terms of the fact that they carried out the tasks assigned to them and did not suffer such losses as the current professional army of the Russian Federation has already suffered in Ukraine. Yes, I forgot to tell you that I have been in the 56th uh, Deshabe since 1993 and have been observing its collapse for 30 years. I remember 1999, the beginning of the war in Chechnya. Then, as a teenager, I accompanied my father there to go to war. At about three in the morning, the first Deshabe lined up on the parade ground near the headquarters, and the regiment command, regimental commander uh, brought the combat order to the battalion that it was necessary uh, to make a forced march, that it was necessary to engage in battle in the bandit formations of the self-proclaimed Ichkeria. Remind you of anything? Didn't Ukraine also react to the uh, LDNR? That it is dangerous, and if one of the soldiers 
for some reason does not want to or cannot do this, and it is necessary to get out of order, uh, yet the reasons may be different from one family uh, to, uh, the reasons may be different. One in the family, uh, religious or a sick mother, but then no one went, uh, but then no one went out of action, not one. Although apart from the officers, the battalion, about 500 people, consisted of, of conscript soldiers aged mainly from 18 to 20. It was a qualitatively and fundamentally different army. This is the army that they had in 1999. Yes, it was not perfect. It needed order and reforms, but the army of that time was head and shoulders above the one that had been reformed over the past 23 years. As for the current one, a huge number of contract soldiers refused to go to the war in Ukraine, which also played a role in the failure of that special operation. I remember that all of the two months that I was on the front line, we daily hoped that we would be replaced and allowed to move to the second line to rest, wash, and recover. <clears throat> but this never happened, because as it turned out, there was no one to change for.